Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Hi, my name is Vicki McDaniel and I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and I struggle with codependency and public speaking. Um, I was sweating buckets just trying to write this. Like you, I did not come to this place by accident. I grew up with a functional alcoholic and uh, meaning he kept a job. But as the oldest of three kids, I say I was groomed to be a good codependent. Our family was chaotic and we had a lot of secrets and kept a lot of shame. I left home at the age of 17 to get out of the stress and the mess. I eventually married and I made sure that he was a Christian and did not drink. In my naive thinking, I assumed that that would mean we would live happily ever after. But after our second child was born, reality hit and we began to have serious marital issues. Because of those issues, I sought therapy or help. I found therapy to be incredibly humbling and hard and enlightening. Um, in those sessions, I began to understand better how my family that I grew up in had affected me and the way that I interacted in relationships. About that same time, I also decided that I needed to go back to school, that if this marriage didn't make it, that I needed to be able to bring in more money. So between school and going to therapy, at some point I decided if you can't beat them, I might as well join them. And at that point I began to seek a degree in counseling. After 19 years of marriage, um, it ended in divorce. And my two daughters and I struggled with that loss and those adjustments, but we eventually healed and, and even began to thrive. I, I graduated with my counseling degree. I have to tell you that it was 20 plus years of going to school, not full time, part time and off and on, but um, I just kept going. Um, the girls grew up and um, went to college and I was working in a hospital psychiatric unit and um, loved that work, worked in four different units in the beginning. Also at that same time, I met uh, Michael, who's my current husband, and while we were finishing up our degrees, uh, we eventually married, and it was at that time that I moved from Memphis to Knoxville when the youngest daughter went off to college. I want to give you background all this time while I was going to school and going to therapy. I, I had no desire to be associated with anything having to do with Christian counseling. Um, at the time, I didn't feel like they had a good professional relationship, and, and I believed and wanted my faith to come across in my counseling, but I wanted to, to love people like I think Jesus would, but without advertising. So my, and also at the same time, my experience with churches um, was very disappointing. I found churches not well equipped or had any desire to deal with people with addictions or families that dealt with it or mental health issues. And so I, I um, had a, in my mind that I never really wanted to do anything um, associated with Christian counseling. I felt like churches in general would say, go to your mental health facility, get your meds, get fixed, and then, then you come back and we'll try to love you. So I had that going into my uh, professional life. Mike and I were visiting different churches and we had visited Cokesbury several times. Um, and one Sunday I saw an announcement about a recovery ministry being started called Celebrate Recovery. I was intrigued and excited and I began attending um, pretty quickly after they started. And I decided I wanted to volunteer. I remember asking Gil Smith, our former recovery pastor, um, is there a way I could serve? And he asked me a really good question. He asked me, so is there something you're passionate about or something that you feel like you're a, you do it well? And, and I said, yeah, I've done a lot of anger management classes. Would that be something? He goes, that is perfect. The longer I'm sober, the more angry I get. And um, so we, we laughed and, and the story began. I started facilitating 12 week anger management groups and I did that three to four times a year. After three years of doing that and loving this place, um, the church decided that they wanted to hire a clinical therapist to serve the recovery community, the community as a whole, and the church. And um, I got the job, and I'm going to thank Rebecca Fetzer for hiring me. Um, thank you. God knew where I could best serve, despite 
my arrogant previous plans about never wanting to be associated as a Christian counselor or affiliated with the church, but this was different and I, I can't tell you how grateful I am that he did not listen to me for advice and guidance or go by my plans, but um, he brought me to this place and I know that. I cannot share with you all the miracles I've witnessed because of confidentiality issues, but there are many and some of you are sitting in front of me tonight. I've also witnessed incredible suffering and heartache, but through it all, God has sustained me and us. Somehow it's 18 years later and it's time for me to step down from full-time service and explore how God can use me in this stage of my life. I wanna take a minute and I wanna thank my husband Michael for his love, patience, support, and care that he's given me all these years. I worked a lot and it required a lot of him. Um, I was bad about not wanting to talk or listen when I got home because I had been doing that all day. Um, and he was very supportive. My adult children, Lindsay, Jessica, and John Michael also provided a lot of love and support. And they, they shared me because I did work a lot and was tired a lot. Uh, I also want to thank Mark who has led this recovery ministry for the last 10 years. Uh, He's taught me a lot, some of which I wanted to know and some which I didn't. But um, also there have been so many people that I've learned from and have invested in me and, and the time and the energy and I can never name or name them all. I trust you know who you are though. My best wisdom to leave you with is to show up. God is able and willing. I'm astounded, amazed and incredibly grateful to have shared this journey with you. And this is not goodbye, but I'll see you around. Thank you. Let's pray together. Sweet Jesus, thank you for this time and for this room and for these people. And especially tonight, Lord, for the work that you have done so faithfully through our servant and our, our sister in Christ, Vicki, we're just, we're, we're glad for the work that you brought through her, the results that happened as a result of her willingness to be available to you and for the filling of the spirit in her that was so, so, has been so, so, and is so, so obvious. Use that spirit to open us to your truth tonight. In your sweet name we pray, amen. So some of you know this and some of you don't, but Cokesbury's had a really big investment in therapy for a long, long time. And um, when I got here, the, um, the therapy office was in where, where our recovery office is now. And so what happened to you, I really, I sort of feel bad, kind of bad for people that were um, clients back in that earlier day, because back in that earlier day, and he's... Gary Wilson is here tonight, but so Gary was in that office and I was in that office. And so if you were a client, oftentimes you had to like put up with the two of us. And so we kind of said that, I know, so we kind of said like, if you didn't come in with stuff really going on in your life, we could get you there in about 20 minutes with us, you know, hanging out in that office. So then um, the office moved across the street into a, so, sort of seldom used trailer. And um, that trailer had all kind of interesting features like bull weevils that would like come up through the floor and all kind of stuff. And it was just like kind of the, wet, the wild, wild west over there. So we did that for a while. And then um, we moved the counseling out to Hardin Valley, out to an office building up above McDonald's out there in Hardin Valley. And we've recently moved the counseling center to a new office they sold that office in Art Valley to a new office um, over by Double Dogs on uh, Kingston Pike. If you go past Double Dogs and turn right, that's I think that's Ebenezer or whatever, then you go down and it's on the left. So all that to say, long history with therapy here. And I wanna talk about why that is tonight and why we have coupled over, over this time and it's become more and more and more intentional. Why we have coupled recovery with therapy, why we believe it's so important that those two belong together in the work that we do here, in this, in this, in this room and in all the rooms that we share, open share groups, and other places where we serve, 
people that um, are working on dealing with freedom from a compulsion? Why do we think those are a match? Why do we think that teaching trauma classes in a match is a match? Why do we see that connection? We're going to be talking about that tonight. So I want to start off with this quote. The decision to seek treatment for addiction is not an easy one and requires a great deal of trust between people and their counselors. And you can expand the understanding of counselors to people that lead um, our counselors in treatment centers, inpatient, outpatient, all of that. As such, counselors should take care to create a strong bond with their patients known as a therapeutic alliance. And we would, we would probably amend that quote to say that we call that a, more of a, of a triad, a therapeutic triad. And we see you, we see your therapist or your counselor, group leader, sponsor. We'll get into the broadening of this here in a minute. And then also we see the power and the, the loving authority of the Holy Spirit, amen? We see that as one of the pieces of that, of that relationship. A therapeutic alliance is the trust patients feel with their counselors, allowing them to feel vulnerable, sorting out their problems and work together effectively. Strong alliances like this ensure that patients view their counselors as trustworthy and know that their best interests are on the forefront. This allows counselors and patients to work together even during tribulation, even during tough times. While this trust takes time to develop, patients should eventually feel comfortable speaking freely during sessions, feel relief after an appointment, here's the thing, and feel a desire to go back. So I wanna talk about uh, tonight about the, the, how broad the understanding of therapy is. And I also want to talk about some myths about, some myths about therapy that I think are, are important for us to understand. One of those is this, is that we get a ton of phone calls in our office about someone who has got something going on in their life bigger than they are. We call that a compulsion. And the first thing that people want to know is, do you guys, do you guys have any kind of a counseling center? And we say, yeah, you know, we do have a counseling center. It's been around a long time. Tell us what's going on. Well, Johnny or Susie or whoever, they drink too much, they drug too much, they something too much. And so they just need, they need to go see a therapist somehow and they need to talk about that. And we say, we're gonna really recommend that while your loved one or friend or whoever that is that you're talking about is in direct active addiction or direct active compulsion, that they begin by trying to get some sober time prior to us trying to do that kind of therapeutic work. And people generally don't like that because people generally wanna believe that what you need to do is you need to, you need to go see a counselor and the counselor is going to tell you what to do. And the counselor is going to do 95% of the work. And you're going to do five. Because after all, you know, you're, you're the one that's paying the bill, right? And so they should be the one really producing the work. And they're going to explain to you how you're screwed up. And then you're going to listen and you're going to believe 3% of that. And then you're going to go home. And because you've had four counseling sessions, woohoo, four counseling sessions, you're going to be fixed and then everything's gonna be okay. Does that pretty much get it? You know, counseling's not always the first step in recovery. Sometimes the first step in recovery is getting down to a good old fashioned hard challenge of walking your way through step one. Getting your way through the basics of step one, that life as you know it is out of control, unmanageable, and that you don't have a way to be able to create the way out. So therapy is not always appropriate. Secondly, myth number two, therapy, which is what I've been talking about somewhat, therapy replaces all other, all other recovery tools. I mean, if you, 
If you go and you begin to deal with your compulsion and you get six weeks clean, then the next thing you do is you connect with a therapist. And once you connect with a therapist, you get a free pass, kind of like getting the, um, the vaccine card. And it goes, Susie no longer needs to go to meetings for her compulsion of choice. She no longer needs a sponsor. She no longer needs the recovery literature. She no longer needs places, fellowship in places like this. All she needs to do is make that one hour, which is amazing to me, is meet that one hour appointment with therapist A, B, C, or D. Can't be true. Therapy is a complement of all of the other recovery tools that we regularly introduce to people and to all of us. It's a complement to all of those other tools. It works in a sync. It works in a, it works in a, in a team-based environment with all of those other tools. And to expect more than that is to really say that I've got, a, I've got an inauthentic view of what really is gonna be accomplished in that place. Myth, myth number three. Therapy, which is, so you, you, this happens all the time. You go, to a, you go to a, let's say you go to an inpatient treatment facility to deal with your compulsion. And at that facility, you have group time, you have individual counseling sessions time, you have some individual work time, you have some time where you're learning some of the other tools of recovery, like how to be in a relationship with a sponsor, those kinds of those kinds of pieces of this. And then you do, after your four weeks that you're there or five weeks that you're there, you assume that because the program ended, all of the work that you just started doing on what was happening in your life, everything you just started unraveling, well, all that's kind of done now. You know, all that's kind of, all that's kind of accomplished now, which is like, where we get into so many things that happen to us in aftercare is we don't have aftercare. We believe that when we leave, whatever it is we started, we're done. Whatever it is that sort of got uncovered, which is just beginning to be uncovered for most of us, when we get into trauma in our lives, we just begin to let that trauma see a little bit of the surface, kind of like seeing the very top, the very top of an iceberg, but there's so much more below. And one of the best things that can happen when you begin to get some sober time dealing with your compulsion of, that, of choice is to put yourself into regular rhythmical therapy, to have the time and to be able to put the focus on and to be able to put the energy into and to be able to put the regularity into doing the work of uncovering where the pain is, what it is you are on the run from, what it is you're most afraid of, what it is you feel like you're failing at, what it is you feel the most guilt about, what it is you feel the most ashamed about, why it is you feel worthless in the way that you do, because all of those feelings, when you begin to get sober, they don't just sort of magically go away. As a matter of fact, like we have to understand, we've been using our drug or compulsion of choice to be able to avoid those feelings, most likely for quite a long time. And for a while, we thought we were pretty good at that, right? And so when I just get started unraveling the yarn, you can imagine like taking a baseball and I begin to unravel, you know, the yarn of that or taking something that is made out of yarn like that. It takes a while to unravel that, doesn't it? It ain't gonna happen in 10 seconds. You're gonna be at it a while. And so, so therapy doesn't fix most things in two sessions. And I mean, if I, ask, if I ask most people, how long do you think, how much time do you think you're gonna need to spend with a therapist? They're gonna wanna say, they're not gonna give me a criterion answer. They're gonna give me a, 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 a date line answer. They're gonna go, well, I think six weeks. You know, when you, when you talk to people about doing treatment, inpatient treatment, number one question, how much does it cost? My answer, how much have you spent lately on your compulsion? Add up the last two years, 
even codependency, how much of you, maybe especially codependency, how much have you spent lately on your compulsion of choice in the last year, in the last 18 months, in the last two years? How much? I will about guarantee you it's more than whatever I'm, I'm talking about. The next thing is gonna be, how long is this gonna be? And I'm gonna go, as long as it's gonna be. I know, but like, how long does the program last? I'm gonna go, it's gonna last, hopefully it's gonna last, whatever that means, for the rest of your life. I know, but like, how long do I have to be there? It's like, I hope that you'll wanna not come home. But how long? Well, it's five weeks. Oh! So I put it off as long as I can because I'm gonna get that oh. Oh! I can't, I can't be, I mean, I can't be gone five weeks. I have work, I mean, and how's work going for you right now? Well, I mean, uh, well, I mean, you know, like, and well, I not, and I mean, like, I gotta be home. I'm like, how's home going right now? Well, I mean, you know, like, I, I mean, I just, I just don't know that I can do that for like five weeks. It's like in the case of drugs or alcohol, it's like, whoa, you've been getting high for four years. Sounds pretty economical to me. The real answer you want to be able to give is, is you're going to be there until you want to be there. Until you start really healing from the heart out. Not from the head in, but from the heart out. So no, good therapy doesn't fix most issues in a couple of sessions. Myth number four. One therapist is equal to a whole treatment team. One therapist is equal to a whole treatment team. Like when you start to do therapy at the Cokesbury Counseling Center, especially if you're in recovery, no one in our counseling center is gonna say to you, now listen, you're gonna sign this piece of paper and on it, you're gonna say that you are not gonna talk to a sponsor or anybody else in the program at meetings or anywhere else while you're doing therapy with us because it's just gotta be us because we're the ones that are gonna take charge now. Nobody ever says that. Because we know that in order for any of us to get better, we need a team of people around us. Recovery is about experience, it's about strength, and it's about hope. That experience, strength, and hope comes from a wide range of people. Some people that you know, some people that you don't know. Some people that you're getting to know in meetings, some people that become a sponsor, some people that become friends of yours, and people that begin to teach you when you're in, in things like this women's, women's step study, people that you would never believe become your teachers, become your teachers because you've never had them do that before. But in that group, at that time, God sets it up so they begin to speak into your life, amen? And see, that's the breadth, that's actually the breadth of therapy. A sponsor is not a therapist, but a sponsor uses the Holy Spirit sometimes to be able to bring about heart healing in our lives. They don't have a clinical degree, they don't do therapy, they're not licensed to do it, but they end up speaking the truth of God the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ into our lives. Other people in our lives expand the process of therapy. You begin to talk to somebody else about, well, I learned this when I was talking to my therapist the other day. And that friend of yours says, yes, you know, I really see that in you. They're helping you with the process. Many people fit into the mix of the therapeutic community. Myth number five. Therapy will somehow magically get me to sobriety. Therapy will magically get me to sobriety. What needs to happen is we need to get to the root source of where our pain is, and then we have to learn how to be able to handle life on life's terms with that pain, and we have to, be, we have to learn how to be able to release, release the compulsion that we've been using to avoid that. That's a multi-step, multi-discipline process where yes, I'm going to meetings. Yes, I'm seeing a therapist. Yes, I have a sponsor. Yes, I'm reading literature. Yes to all of that. And that's the way sobriety begins to come about. You are learning an entirely new way to live. 
not a way, not a way to deal with your drug or compulsion of choice, but actually an entirely new way to live. That takes multiple people in your life to be able to do that. Myth number six, therapy is always clinical and always one-on-one. -on -one. You see how we've talked about that, right? Lots of ways that this is expanded out through lots of people, not always one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes maybe somebody else will get involved as, as sort of the feedback person in that process. They can be very, very valuable. They can be very, very valuable. But man, what I know for sure is the clearest, cleanest, most effective way to not deal with relapse in our compulsions is to get to the source of the pain, is to get to the source of the secret, is to get to the source of where the wreckage is, is to get to the source of what we decided needed to be covered over what we decided needed to be accommodated, what we decided needed to be avoided, what we decided needed to be soothed in the way that we, and here's the thing, in the way that we, right, we individually decided that needed to be done. There's all kinds of stories in the Bible where God is literally, literally chasing people down who have all of the issues that we talk about all the time in this room. And when God finally, famous people, you've, you've maybe heard if you've ever read any, you know any Bible characters, famous people I'm talking about, like finally God runs them down and finally they have nowhere else to go. You can look up stories about this guy, David, in the, in the first half of the Bible. He's a star character of this. No, finally nowhere else to go. God finds him in this, hiding out literally in this cave. And finally he says to him, so listen, you're gonna keep running or are we gonna sit here? What are we gonna do? Are we gonna, talk, are we gonna really get into this? Or basically he's, what he's trying to say to David is this, if you keep running, you're gonna keep dying. If you wanna start living, you've gotta stop running. And sooner or later, when you stop running, you've got to sit down and spend solid blocks of time with me. Because in the end, any compulsion in the end is a spiritual disease. It really has everything to do with what's going on between us and God. How we believe God, whether it's true or not, how we believe God feels about us and whether it's true or not, how we believe we feel about God. And see, one of the reasons that I'm so, so proud of the work that we do at the Coke Spray Counseling Center is because I know, I know that at that place, every single day, from the beginning of that day to the end of that day, I know that Jesus is in those rooms. I know that the Holy Spirit is in those rooms. I know that God is in those rooms. I know that during those hours, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are all over that place and all over those people. And you know what I say? Why wouldn't you want them there? Why wouldn't you want them there? Like, you know, people sometimes go, oh, so you have a counseling center? This is always a, this is always a great conversation for me. So you have a counseling center, yeah. It's kind of like what Vicky said. Well, I mean, is it a Christian counseling center? <laughs> I'm like, well, like the thing is, like it's odd that way because I mean, like we're a Christian church, we follow Jesus, and so yeah, you know, it, it's it's a Christian counseling center. Oh, I'm like, why? Why does that bother you? Well, you know, it's like um, sometimes those Christians they just get a little bit judgy. I'm like, well, you know what? It's really not those Christians. It's like, you must be hanging out with the wrong Christians. I don't know, but that isn't true at our counseling center. What's true at our counseling center is the love of Jesus Christ has becomes evident, clear, obvious, available, and healing. All of those. 
Sometimes what you hear in therapy, you're not gonna like. I mean, like, sometimes you're not gonna like the therapist right away, normal, keep going. Like Vicky said, just keep going. Sometimes you're gonna think you want a different therapist, normal, don't do it right away. Just, you're about to really, really grow. Don't do it right away. Don't make it easier. Let it be harder. Sometimes you're gonna wanna believe that things aren't going the way you want them to go. Keep going. You're about to discover some new things. And sometimes that God, sometimes in those kinds of conversations, God is gonna catch you by surprise. He's really gonna catch you by surprise. People wanna believe that, well, you know, that something happens in my marriage. Automatically, what I gotta do is I gotta go to the counseling center. We're gonna sit down together, the two of us, and I'm gonna tell her or him, the therapist, every single thing that they did wrong. And Then I'm gonna tell her every single thing that he did wrong. And you know what? Once I get that out there, it's gonna be okay. It's like, yeah, but you've been doing that with each other for a hundred years. I mean, like you've been telling each other all that for a hundred years, it's somehow not okay. Why is that? That's because I've, I've been unwilling to look at what is going on with me, where my level of pain is, where I'm not feeling like something's working right with me. And see, the reality of it is, None of us, none of us have the capacity. This is a step one in spades. None of us actually have the capacity to make other people happy. Amen? None of us, not our children, not our husbands, not our wives, not our coworkers, not our friends, not anybody else. We really do not have that capacity. We might be able to jack it up for a little while, but we really don't have have that capacity to pull that off. That is because that right there, that kind of joy is the work of the Lord, amen? That is the work of God. That isn't, that isn't my work. That is the work of God. And that's what we're hoping that, what we're hoping that when you come to the counseling center and you, you do some therapy, you'll begin to see some, some, of what I'm, some of what I'm talking about. I wanna read this to you. I have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them all right now. But when the friend, the Holy Spirit comes, the spirit of truth, he will take you by the hand and guide you into all the truth that there is. He won't draw attention to himself but will make sense out of what is about to happen. And indeed, out of all that I have done and said, he will honor me and he will take for me and deliver it to you. Everything the Father has is also mine. That's, what I've, that's why I've said he takes from me and delivers to you. The therapy that we're convinced of and convicted of at Cokesbury, the work that is so diligently done by people that work at our center has been so diligently done and there's more to come through the work that Vicki has done there as our director. That is exactly what it's about. We believe that the Holy Spirit is giving us the opportunity to take the riches that he is providing and to be able to provide them to people like us that are hurting, confused, bewildered, afraid, 100 million other things. Man, don't be afraid of that process. It's a good one for recovery. It's, it's necessary and it's worth it.